we turn to Genesis chapter 6, and the Genesis 6 experiment is what I call it. What took place in Genesis 6? The first thing I'm going to address is the sons of God or the sons of Seth. There are a lot of people, and I'm finding this more and more in the Torah communities, parroting the same thing that is coming out of seminaries and standard evangelical Christianity. They, they teach in the seminaries that the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 were the good sons of Seth mating with the bad daughters of Cain. Okay, so let's address that. Um, and I'm seeing the same thing in the Torah communities. Uh, they're saying this, you know, they're just parroting that. Going back to the whisper down the lane idea, is you get the, the closer you get to the original source material, you, they all believe that it was angels. And the sons of God was a reference to angels coming down and mating with women. You get six people later, 6,000 years later, and you got, well, we heard the sons of Seth mated with Cain's daughters. <laughs> text doesn't say that. Turn your, open your Bible if you've got it to Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4, and see if you see anything in there mentioning Seth or Cain. Nothing there. And the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra biblical text, we of course get a lot more information, and it's all again compiled in this uh, volume all together here. Uh, if you look in the testimony of Genesis with some of these other ones, Genesis says the sons of God saw the daughters of men, they were fair, and they took wives of all which they chose. Sinking right up to the same chapter and verse numbers, First Enoch chapter 6, 1 and 2, says the angels, the children of heaven, were the ones that did this. The book of Jubilees comes right out and tells you point blank, the angels of God saw the women, and they did what they did. Um, there is absolutely nothing in Genesis 6 which in any way refers to Seth or Cain or their offspring. Rather, the phrase sons of God is a reference applied to angels just as it was in the book of Job, which actually predates Genesis. We talked about that in the previous session where we have the creation account going on right here and the morning star saying together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Right here, where, uh, uh, just a simple question. Were the good sons of Seth present at creation? No, of course not. But the angels sure were. Uh, we have numerous other accounts of uh, other writers, uh, 50 A.D. Philo in his work Questions and Answers on Genesis Book 1, point number 92, says, These giants were sprung from a combined procreation of two natures, namely from angels and mortal women. But sometimes Moses styles the angels the sons of God. So he's saying, you know, Moses chose the title for angels sometimes to be referred to as sons of God, uh, which maybe he got it from Job. <laughs> or from Enoch, either way. Uh, Clement is a disciple of Peter. He talks about the same thing in an uh, excerpt from a homily number 8, chapter 13. It says, but when having assumed these forms, the angels, they convicted as covetous those who stole them and changed themselves into the nature of men in order that living holily and showing the possibility of so living, they might subject ungrateful to punishment Yet having become in all respects men, they also partook of human lust, and being brought tinder, its subjection, they fell into cohabitation with women. A little bit cryptic, but you get the idea of what he's talking about there. Um, Josephus, writing in Antiquities of the Jews, book 1, chapter 3, and book 5, chapter 2.3, Josephus says, For many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence they had in their own strength for the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians call giants and he says again for which reason they removed their camp to Hebron and when they had taken it they slew the inhabitants there were till then left the race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this day, unlike to any credible relations of other men. So he's basically saying, we've got the museum of the giants here. In the, this is uh, the first you know, 100 years AD or so, 100 AD thereabouts, that they still had the museum of the bones of the giants that were the offspring of the angels. Now, reading through the text, we see that this is where they landed. Oh, by the way, this map right here, this is a... Uh, uh, variation of the Mercator map. Uh, the Mercator map is the map where they unroll the ball into a flat map. We've all seen it in the classrooms. Um, we've seen, th this is a variation of it. The one we've seen in the classrooms, this one you can tell everything looks kind of curved at the top, even though it's a, you know, it's a rectangular thing, but you can see the sort of the perspective skewing there. The Mercator map though, uh, and even in this map, look how big Greenland looks right there. On the Mercator map, Greenland's almost as big as Africa. 
but if you look up the actual dimensions of Greenland, it's like not a whole lot bigger than Texas. So even on the ball maps that we've all seen our whole life, the maps are all wrong. There was a West Wing episode, in fact, uh, on the TV show West Wing, where they had some experts come in, and they were showing all the problems, and they were trying to lobby for the new maps to be put into schools, and they're showing how all the scales are completely wrong of everything that we've all seen, that we all grew up with, it's all wrong. The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But yes. it distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Uh, look at Greenland. Okay. Now look at Africa. Okay. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico, when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait. Relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing is where you think it is. So, you know, like I said earlier, I'm still looking at everything going, what is the truth here? Because even what we've been told about the ball is a lie, or at least inaccurate, if not intentionally, you know, a lie here. Regardless, if we stretched out the earth, whatever shape it may be, that's where the fallen angels landed in the days of Jared, according to the Book of Enoch. Now, a researcher by the name of David Flynn uh, pointed something out really interesting based on this map that it was 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian, which was the original Prime Meridian before they changed it to Greenwich for political reasons and whatnot. And in the, the occult, the Paris Prime Meridian was known as the Devil's Line. So if you looked at it, the, like the Dan Brown's uh, Da Vinci Code or any of that stuff, uh, he pointed out some of those things. But if going from the original Prime Meridian, it was 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 or 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian. Um, and he also noticed that it was 2012 nautical miles from that location to the Paris Prime Meridian and 2012 nautical miles from that location to the equator, which caused a lot of researchers to kind of scratch their head and wonder if there's some kind of connection that might happen on the infamous date of December 21st, 2012, which of course I don't believe anything did happen at the time, but there were a lot of interesting numbers to look at. Now, while those numbers may be interesting, if in fact the whole globe thing is a lie, then uh, these numbers probably go out the window anyway. <laughs> um, but interesting nonetheless. So Genesis 6, Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God, angels, came unto the daughters of men. Now, even in the Sethite theory, that doesn't make sense, the wording, does it? Because Seth is still men. They're still people, right? So the way it's worded, the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, the, the, clearly you got two types being referred to here. The, linguistically, it makes no sense. 
uh, to, to go the route of kissing cousins. Now, I've titled this the Archon Invasion, so let me just address the word Archon. Uh, it shows up, it's just a Greek word. It's used, for instance, in Ephesians 2 2, talk about the prince of the power of the air. Uh, like I said, it's just a Greek word, it's a masculine noun that means chief, ruler, prince, leader, somebody in the position of commander, of, uh, the position of authority, basically. The Book of Enoch names 20 archons uh, of the 200 watcher class angels who sinned with the daughters of men. We see in First Enoch chapter 6 that it was in the days of Jared that they landed on Mount Hermon, and here are a bunch of names. These are what I would consider to be the archons. They were the leaders over the rest of the 200. Uh, I showed a little bit of this in one of the previous sessions, a pre-flood pre Nephilim timeline. If my calculations are correct, I believe the Genesis 6 experiment, when the angels came down and mated with women in the days of Jared, took place in about 3550 B.C., and the book of Enoch tells us the first generation Nephilim offspring, the direct offspring of angels that mated with women, would only live for 500 years. And in those 500 years, they were to kill each other off in a massive civil war that the Greeks eventually stylized into what became known as the Clash of the Titans. So we've seen the movies and stuff like that. That goes back to this original first generation Nephilim uh, civil war. Josephus likens the first generation to the Titans of Greek mythology. So go forward 500 years from 3550, end up in about the 3050 to 3000 year, uh, uh, BC time frame. Uh, and when you get close to that 3000, you start to see all kinds of interesting things. The, Ma the Mayan Aztec calendar stone shows up 3114 BC. That's where everybody got the December 21st, 2012 deal. Um, just real quick on that, a lot of us, as we were getting close to 2012, um, December 21st, we're speculating on what might happen because the ancients were clearly pointing to that date. There's no doubt about it. The problem is our calendars are off. Um, when you do the research, you realize that Yeshua was born on September 11th, 3 BC, on the Gregorian calendar that's reckoned as negative 2. So if it's reckoned as negative 2, then our calendars are off by two years. I believe the date that the ancients were really pointing toward was December 21st, 2010. And on that night, the moon went blood red over the shoulders of Orion, looking like a decapitated head. At the same time, Iraq announced its fully formed government, and the entire planet shook. There were earthquake uh, meters that checked earthquake activity. All of them went into the black that night. So the whole world was shaking. Right after that, we had fish and bird die-offs. You know, hundreds of thousands of birds falling from the sky just for no apparent reason. Millions of fish beaching themselves for no apparent reason. And breed specific at that. It wasn't like a whole bunch of birds. It was like one type of bird or one type of fish. Uh, and then the uh, people who tracked the constellations or whatnot, they said we need to add the 13th sign to the zodiac. You know, we have the 12 signs of the zodiac. Well, they said we need to add a new one. And the new one they added was Ophiuchus, which in the mythology was a character named Asclepius, who is known for raising Orion from the dead. And Orion, in the original meaning God had, is Yeshua. But the occult usurped it for Osiris, who is Nimrod. So there were a lot of crazy things that happened on the night of December 21st, 2010, and immediately following. And my take on it is, if all of those things would have happened on December 21st, 2012, everybody in their talking parrot would have been you know, writing books and on TV and you, you name it. Um, but nobody was talking about it because nobody, hardly anybody picked up on what was happening because they're all looking for 2012 when all these amazing things happened in 2010 on the same date, December 21st. So if Yeshua is born in negative two and our calendar is based on the birth of Yeshua, then our calendars are off. Does that make sense? So the, the event that these guys were pointing toward really, in my opinion, was the December 21st, 2010 event. Everybody missed it because the calendars were off for two years. Then you have Adam dying about 20 years later, the death of the first man. Shortly after that, about 20, 25 years later, the first generation Nephilim are done. The civil war is over. They've all been killed off. They're dead. Then uh, shortly after that, their parents, the Watchers, were judged, bound, and buried. And then Enoch is raptured. This is about 700 years before the flood. So that begs the question then, okay, and, and Noah's born, and his daddy names him Rest. That's what, that's what Noah's name means, Rest. So, well, you can see, after the Clash of the Titans, everybody took a deep breath. Well, okay, well, glad that was over with. 
But from the birth of Noah, we had 600 more years to the flood. So what got God so upset 600 years later to wipe out the world with the flood when all this is taken care of 700 years before the flood? Well, that leads into a discussion of what they call multiple incursions. A lot of people who study the subject of the Nephilim believe that when it's talking in Genesis 6 and it says, and also after that, that that means the angels kept coming back again and again and continued to mate with women after the flood. I disagree with that um, because I believe Moses disagrees with that. <laughs> uh, if you just look at this in light of what we learned in the book of Enoch, Genesis 6 then reads, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. What days? The days of Jared. Watchers came down in the days of Jared. And also after that, what, th what does that mean? That means the days of Jared. When the sons of God came unto the daughters of men in the days of Jared, and they bear children to them, the same who were born in the days of Jared, were the mighty men that were of old. And the word old there is in Hebrew the word olam, which is translated like 136 times, oh, is it, uh, yeah, 136 times as everlasting and 110 times as forever. In other words, it's a word that you used for a very long time ago. It's not the word Moses would have used for the giants they just saw in the land of Canaan last week. You know, he's saying the same that we're talking about here are from Olam, long time ago, became the men of renown, the, the gods of the mythology, essentially. So there's nothing in Genesis 6 that would throw you into the post-flood world. Everything's still in a very much in a pre flood context. Now, we have to realize that when the angels did what they did, they, fierced, they, they faced a severe judgment by God. We read about the judgment in um, the book of Enoch. It goes into a great amount of detail. Um, this is where it tells you that they will only live for 500 years, the Nephilim offspring. Um, the parents, the watchers, had to watch their own children, who they loved. They called them the, our, the beloved ones. The parents had to watch their own children massacre each other. Any parents here? How would you like to see your own kids massacre each other? That'd be pretty horrific, wouldn't it? That'd be terrible, awful. Well, that was part of their judgment. Part of their judgment was to watch their own children kill each other off. Then they, were, they received an even more severe judgment when they were bound in chains and put in Tartarus, a, a terrible place of punishment. So in my... Mount Hermon Roswell Connection DVD, I give five reasons why I do not believe angels ever came back to mate with women again. Obviously, the judgment was extremely severe. There's no confirming scriptures. I, I, the Bible says we need two to three witnesses to establish truth. It says that in several places. So if the assumption is that Genesis 6, where it says, and also after that, is a reference to another incursion of angels mating with women, where's your confirming scripture? Give me one other verse that says that angels mated with women. Not there. So the size also began to drop dramatically in the post-flood world. In the pre-flood world, these things are huge, like mind-bogglingly huge. In the post-flood world, yeah, you have the Amorites are a size of cedar trees. They're 36 feet tall. Uh, and you work your way down, you, you get Olga Bashan, who is 15 to 18 feet tall. And you get Goliath, who's about 9 to 12 feet tall. Still very imposing, scary guys. But clearly, the, the further you get away from the flood on the post-flood side, their size is dropping. That Why? If you just mate with an angel, according to Enoch, they become huge, <laughs> really big giants. The world would become corrupted five times over. In 1,200 years from the time of the days of Jared, the days of Jared about 1,200 years before the flood, it says in Genesis 6 that all flesh had become corrupted. It got so bad that God had to, the only option he had was to clean everything out and start over again with the flood. Well, if they were able to corrupt all flesh in 1,200 years by this one incursion of 200 angels, that, from a military perspective, that's a pretty effective campaign. If I was a general, let's say like Lucifer, and the 200 watchers were a platoon for a military campaign, and my platoon was so success, successful that they corrupted all of my enemy's creation in 1,200 years, round two, 400. <laughs> let's get this thing over with. Get 500, you know. They've had five times the amount of time to completely corrupt all flesh if they're going to do multiple incursions. How come we're still here? No, didn't happen. When it comes to things like alien abductions, you always hear reports of extraction of seed, extraction of eggs, of scientific laboratory experiments where people are being tortured and experimented on, and they're growing hybrids and containers and stuff like that. Well, why go through all that if all you got to do is have sex? I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. So these are the five reasons 
Well, I don't believe there was another incursion. Do angels fear? Yeah, absolutely. When before they even got started, some Jaza, the leader of the fallen angels, said before they even got started, he said, look, I fear you will not agree to do this deed with me. He's basically like, ah, you know, we know what we're about to do is a great sin. And I'm afraid I'm going to go through with it. And you guys are going to leave me hanging. You're not going to. And so everybody's like, no, 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 we're all with you, dude. And so they, they did a, a mutual vow. They swore amongst each other. No, we're all in. We're all going to do this deal. And Mount Hermon was named Mount Herm Hermon because apparently the word has something to do with taking a vow. That, no, that's why they named it. Uh, when the judgment came upon them in chapter 13, it says they were all afraid and fear and trembling seized them. Who's the mightiest of all the angels? Lucifer. Who beats Lucifer? Oh, uh, Michael. 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 Yeah. So Michael is the mightiest of all the angels. Then, right? You know, Lucifer is obviously a very powerful cherub, but we see in Revelation 12 that Michael goes to fight a war, right? And he's victorious. So Michael is the mightiest of all the angels of God. Well, in Enoch chapter 68, the mighty archangel Michael himself is looking at the judgment of the watchers, and it says, this thing tremble, makes me tremble because of the severity of the judgment of the secrets of the judgment of the angels. He's like, who would not be troubled by looking at this? To paraphrase, he's looking at, he's talking to, to uh, Raphael, and he's like, dude, wow. No one's ever going to do that again. Look at how bad the judgment is on these guys. And he prophesies at the end. He says, neither angel nor man shall have his portion in it, but alone they have received their judgment forever and ever. He just prophesied, right? nobody else is going to do this because the penalty for doing it is so severe that even Michael, the archangel himself, is like, whoa, wow, I'm trembling in my boots here, Raphael. So the angels that did that are the ones that sinned and left their first estate that we read about in 2 Peter and in June. Where 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. The Greek word there is Tartarus. In Greek mythology, Tartarus is the prison of the gods, the titans and whatnot. So a lot of people who don't believe in the angels version of chapter, Genesis 6 and believe the Sethite view, they've got a big problem with these verses. Because who's he talking about there? Satan and his angels? No. They haven't been bound in chains. They're still out and about, aren't they? they? They don't get defeated until Revelation 12. And there's a war in heaven. They're all kicked out. He's still going about as a roaring lion. P uh, Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness. These are the guys that are still with Lucifer. They haven't been bound up yet. The only ones that got bound up were the ones who participated in the Genesis 6 experiment. Um... And Jude says, the angels which kept not the first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Where did these two guys get that information? There's nowhere in the canonized text that even remotely hints at what they're talking about. Well, obviously they had read the book of Enoch, because that book gives all the details that's perfectly in line with what both of these guys said right there. So, you know, for me, I'm like, well, if it's good enough for these guys to read the book, maybe I should read it too. Maybe it might teach me a thing or two. Work for these guys. So again, this is what's going on here. There is no further written documentation of any other incursions of angels mating with women in the Bible. 